Y'all there? How's everybody doing this morning? <laughs> Good? I'm glad. I'm glad. All right, I just love that last time. I was just going to say something about that. I just, how many of y'all know that we have victory in Jesus? Amen? It's just such a good hymn. Well, my name is Mason Scales. I'm so happy to be able to join y'all this morning. Um, just brings me so much joy, and I thank Pastor Tommy and uh, Pastor Rick for this opportunity. Uh, so without further ado, let's just get started with some scripture. Our reading from this past week, I think it was John chapter 16 through 20, and where we're going to be at today is John chapter 16, and we're going to be talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. So this is going to take place in John 16, 5 through 15, but I will warn you, I do have a lot of other scripture as well, so I used to do debate in high school, so I always feel like I have to have the source to back it up, you know, so we have a lot of uh, other scripture to go along, so bear with me, but we're going to get through it together, and so let's just jump into the word. This is going to be John 16, 5 through 15. Here we go. Verse 5, but now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why, this is why I said the spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. All right, that's just so good. But a little bit of context there is that, so we have Jesus, this is taking place, and so, even further back, uh, I believe it's John 13, I want to say, so either John 13 or 14 through 17, this is what we call the upper room discourse. So basically, Jesus is sitting down with his disciples in the upper room, and he's basically telling them all these things um, because he's going to lead soon. It's the last time, one of the last times at least, that he's sitting down with his disciples and talking to them about all these things, and it, it spans over a few chapters. So right here, we're in John chapter 16, and we see at the very beginning, he says, but now I am going away to the one who sent me. So he's saying, the disciples still didn't really understand this, but he, he's saying that he's going to leave soon, but my father is sending another. He calls him the advocate. It says, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the advocate. The promise, the advocate is the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about the promise that Jesus made of the sending of the Holy Spirit. And so I kind of just wanted to start off with, who is this Holy Spirit? Because I feel like a lot of times in church we can get caught up, not caught up, because it's good too. We have three parts of the Trinity. We have God the Father, we have Jesus the Son, and then we have the Holy Spirit. There's actually a book written by, as a pastor and author, Francis Chan. He wrote a book called Forgotten God. And in this book, he basically covered all the aspects of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, what the Holy Spirit does, the roles of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I'm hoping to cover with you today. And... There's a couple of descriptions that I kind of want to go over. So, sorry, first off, this is going to be a little bit more um, teaching than uh, hopefully preaching because uh, it's something that I want us to all be informed about, but hopefully you can receive something from it as well. I just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. So we see descriptors of the Holy Spirit of, like, fire and wind. Um, we see it at the beginning of Acts, Acts chapter 1, we have... Jesus, who is about to ascend to the Father in that very moment, uh, he tells his disciples that you, to, to wait and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then we see in Acts chapter 2, when they are in the upper room, they are waiting with the disciples and whoever else is there, and we see them wait, and it says there's a whooshing wind that enters the building, and then we see that tongues of fire come upon them. And so I really want to focus on this wind part for a second because I just love the definition and defining the Spirit as a wind because I feel like it does a really good job at defining who the Holy Spirit is. Um, because 
we already know a lot about what wind is, especially in this last week. We know a lot about what wind and rain is, I can tell you that. Um, but the wind is something that you can't physically see. It's something that you necessarily, you, you can't touch it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but yet you know that it's there. You may not be able to see it, but you can feel it and you can see the effect that it has around you. And when I was doing some, some more research this, I was w- watching some sermons by some other pastors, and there was this one pastor, he, he was talking about how he went on the sailboat, and he hasn't been on a sailboat before. Uh, I, we used to have a sailboat in the family when we were very young, but uh, I was listening to him talk about it, he says, the first thing they did, they hoist the sails, the sails were up, these are some heavy sails too, it's about 2,500 pounds, it takes multiple people for the biggest sail at least, and they were motor out into the, um, out into the bay, and then he asked the captain, he said, so how do you know when the wind hits the sails? And the captain said, oh, you'll know. And so, and then just a few moments later, the wind hit the sails, and it's like they almost all lost their footing because everybody knew when the wind hit the sails, right? Same thing with the Holy Spirit. If we relate it back to that, when the wind caught the sail, everyone on the boat knew, and everyone could tell something, that ha- something had happened. So when we were focusing on this promise of Jesus, who is the second person of the Trinity, of the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, I want to ask you all a question that I want you all to keep in mind throughout when we're talking to each other today. Uh, I want you all to keep this question in mind throughout this. So the question is, if the Holy Spirit were to leave, or if the Holy Spirit were to leave you individually, if the Holy Spirit were to leave this church, would anybody notice and I know that can seem kind of rough on the, uh, on the front side of things, but it's an actual question. And I ask this because the Holy Spirit should have such an impact on our lives in the life of this church that everybody notices, right? And I'm not just talking about that we're gloating that we have the Holy Spirit. I'm not just talking about that we're gloating about certain things that this church is doing, but I'm talking about are we portraying the gifts of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit that Jesus calls and empowers us with to make disciples of all nations. So let's dive a little bit more into that. And so who is this Holy Spirit? Because he's the third person of the Trinity. We talked about him as fire and wind. But let's see how this text defines him as as well. Uh, In John 16. It says, But now I am going away to the one who sent me, the Father, Jesus is going to the Father, and no one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. So I'm going to focus on that word, the advocate. In the Greek, this word means paraclete or parakletos. Uh, And it has multiple meanings, because apparently translating from ancient Greek to English is pretty difficult. Um, but, But... it has meanings such as the advocate. It has meanings such as helper, comforter, counselor. All things that we can also define Jesus as. And so Jesus says here, we're actually going to, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going back on our reading plan a little bit. We're going to go to John 14 for a second. It says, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask that the Father, or, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. He says, another advocate. So he's talking about himself, how Jesus is going to leave, and then, he's gonna, and then he's saying, I will ask the Father, and the Father will send you another, just like him. So Jesus was the advocate for his disciples when they were here on earth. He was the advocate for everyone here on earth when he was here and uh, during his ministry, during his three years that he spent with his disciples. But he's saying, now he has to go to the Father. It's better that it is this way, because now I will send you another And so we see this word paraclete or advocate used again, and he says he will give us another advocate. And then further down, I also like how John 14, 26 puts it. It says, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. So he's saying, and I I believe it's in John 16 as well, what he's saying here is, He's not leaving us alone. He's leaving us with um, something the same, if not better, because he's saying he's sending another. And the reason why I say it may be better, I'll get to this in a second, um, but it says uh, further down that he will live in us. Jesus lived around his disciples, 
but it's saying that the Holy Spirit will live in us. And so I bring all this up to say that sometimes we may think of the Holy Spirit as more of a what than a who. We speak of the Holy Spirit as an it rather than a he, the person of the Spirit. And we relate to the Holy Spirit as a force rather than a friend. Because when Jesus was on the earth, he was related to as a friend of the disciples, also teacher, these words that we have up here, advocate, comforter, counselor. He was related to all these things. And when Jesus says he will send you another, that another implies that he will be like Jesus. So I just want to let you know today that the Holy Spirit is a person to be known, not just a force to be utilized. So I kind of want to go into the roles of the Holy Spirit and the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our life. The Holy Spirit operates in so many different ways, uh, different actions. We can, we can talk about the gifts of the Spirit, but I want, just want to talk about in our daily lives how the Holy Spirit ap- um, operates. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the saving role of the Holy Spirit. And I believe there's multiple parts to this one, because the Holy Spirit does have multiple, um, what's the word, just multiple endeavors in our, in us, in our salvation. So... It says right here, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me. We've read this. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because what I've told you, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if you don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And so the first part of this is the, of the salvation role of the Holy Spirit would be that because the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus goes to be with his Father. If Jesus doesn't go be with his Father then we aren't atoned for our sins. And I believe this is a beautiful thing. Uh, Inevitably, we were the ones that sent him to the cross because of our sins, but it's a place that he had to go because of our sins. And so because the Holy Spirit is coming, or you could say because Jesus is going to the Father, we receive the Holy Spirit. And I kind of just covered this, but I asked myself, I like to ask a lot of questions of the text when I'm planning these things out. And one question that I immediately asked myself is, well, why did Jesus need to leave to go be with the Father? Why couldn't we just have both? But I think I kind of just answered that. It's because he says he will send another just like him after he goes to the Father. And so, let's see. The second part of the saving role of the Holy Spirit is how the Holy Spirit draws us nearer to Jesus, right? It is important to note that the Holy Spirit is all around us. When he's talking to his disciples, he said that the whole when he's talking to the disciples in the upper room before he goes to be with the Father, he says, the Holy Spirit is with you. He will soon be in you. And then in Acts 1, we see how he says, then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. We'll get to more of that in a second. But he says the saving role, or this isn't Jesus, this is me, (laughs) but this is the saving role of the Holy Spirit is that he is drawing us nearer to Jesus because he longs for all of us to be saved, right? Right? And the Holy Spirit first works around us to draw us to Jesus. See, when you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. At the moment of salvation, we call it the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then dwells in you. But before that, you may not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, but you have the Holy Spirit around you. The Holy Spirit is beckoning to you. He's working on your heart still because he longs for you to be saved, right? And so, in fact, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what this is saying is no one comes to the Father, no one comes to Jesus without the Holy Spirit. So this is kind of the salvation role that the Spirit plays in our lives. The Holy Spirit is constantly near us and drawing us closer to Jesus for the purpose of salvation. And I hinted at this a little before. We were talking about the location that the Holy Spirit plays in our life. We have, again, he was talking to his disciples. He said, the Holy Spirit will be with you. He's around you. That is before your salvation. The Holy Spirit will be in you. That is the indwelling of the Spirit at the moment of salvation. And then... Something more interesting, not more interesting, but he says in uh, chapter 1 of Acts, before he uh, ascends to heaven, he says the Holy Spirit will come upon you. 
And I find this word upon, it is different. And sorry, I keep saying in the Greek, but I like looking at these words in Greek to see what they truly mean. It says in the Greek is epi, E-P-I. And it's a different preposition. We have, he will be with you, in you, and upon you. And what this is talking about is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, different from your salvation. And so the Spirit of God dwells in all of our spirits as saved believers. And so we have the first stage before salvation, the second stage at salvation with the indwelling, and then the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And because that verse that I was talking about in Acts 1.8, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. On being that word, apai in the Greek, upon you, when the power comes upon you. So that's the salvation role of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit as a teacher. Because I think we can all, uh, all come into agreement that the Holy Spirit definitely teaches us a, a lot of things as we go about our daily lives. And what I mean is, um, about this is that the Holy Spirit provides in our life truth and he guides us. We'll get to more of those specifically in a second. But if we run it back to John 14 again, in verse 26, it says, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. And I personally, I find this one very comforting because it, it's just very comforting to me just to know I have a teacher to help me interpret things that spiritually in my life. I have someone that is indwelling in, within me that teaches me the things about God, about his righteousness, about his son. And a good example of this is that when we're reading the Bible, if we are reading the Bible without the help of the Holy Spirit, it would be pretty difficult to understand and interpret. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are able to interpret these things and we're able to know these things a little bit better. And the reason I say this, and it makes it more apparent to me, um, is... I go, to, I go to Lamar, I'm a freshman at Lamar, and I get questioned a lot about my faith. I have a lot of Christian friends, and then I have a lot of, um, we'll call them non-Christian friends, I guess, and I get asked questions from both respectively, but for example, if I'm getting asked a question from either side, and they'll say, well, isn't God this, isn't God that, isn't Jesus this, isn't Jesus that? I just, I'm appalled sometimes because I have to say, what Bible are you reading? Because that, that, that wasn't in my book. That wasn't in my holy revelation, my divine uh, revelation. And so we, we talk about it, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can come into agreement about what this word says and the interpretation. And another way, like even as I'm preparing to, to speak like this, I'll, I've read through John 16 multiple times. But as I'm reading through John 16 this time, it's like different things pop out of the page because the Holy Spirit revealing things like that, teaching me things like that, revealing things like that. And so that is what the teaching role of the Holy Spirit does, not necessarily just in the form of reading your Bible. Um, like I, I've also seen, uh, in also regards to reading your Bible, people will take their Bible, this is my Bible, New Living Translation, and they'll take their Bible and say, God, give me a word. What are you speaking to me? All right, that's my word. I'm going to go about my day living like that now. And I don't discredit that. I don't think that's not true. But I think when the Holy Spirit is living in us and is giving us truth, that we have better ways of reading our Bible. And the Holy Spirit will reveal the things that he wants to reveal. God will reveal the things that he wants to reveal in that moment. And so that is the teaching role of the Holy Spirit. I got two more for you. Bear with me. We got the convicting role of the Holy Spirit. Let me get my pages back in order so I don't get confused. <clears throat> All right, the convicting role of the Holy Spirit. And what this one means is we're going to go back to John 16, and it says, but in fact, it is, I feel like I've read this a lot, but it, it covers a lot. In fact, it is best for you that I go away. And we'll skip down to verse 8 where it says, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. So why those three things? Why convict the world of sin? Well, that one's pretty easy. Why convict the world of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment? 
And here's what these three, three things mean. It's because we convict the world of its sin to see the true nature of ourselves and of man. That's what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us. He says he will convict the world of God's righteousness to show us the true nature of God. And he will convict the world of judgment In the coming judgment, it says in verse 11, judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. And that ruler of this world is Satan. He's saying that we are being convicted of sin. It's like when you do something wrong, you feel guilty about it. And as a believer, I can only say that that's for the Holy Spirit. Especially when in this world right now where... Some people say different things are right and wrong, but as having the Holy Spirit dwell in me, and I can say this is wrong because the Holy Spirit is revealing that to me. And then he says he will convict us of God's righteousness to show us that we need God. We need God's righteousness. We need God to make us right. And it's because of our sin that we need God to make us right. And then he says he'll convict us and describe to us of God's coming judgment. Because just as it says here, the, the ruler of this world has already been convicted. He's saying that anybody that does not follow Jesus will be convicted in a similar sense. Which can sometimes be a hard pill to swallow. It, it was for me at least. But I think it's important to realize that we have the Holy Spirit as this teacher and this convictor to help us with these things. And one more point on this is if we don't necessarily, if we're displeased with conviction or we don't like conviction by the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about man. I'm not talking about man saying this is right or wrong. But I'm talking about Holy Spirit. Then we are missing out on one of the greatest gifts that God has for us in conviction because God doesn't call us to stay how we are when in salvation. He calls us to something much greater. He calls us to be Christ-like. And through conviction, we say, this is right, this is wrong. Thank you, Jesus. And we can change ourselves to be more Christ-like. And the Holy Spirit working in us, not necessarily just ourselves. And so that is the convicting role of the Holy Spirit. Last but not least, we have the guiding role. And I feel like this one would be the most prominent um, in our world today, or let me give some scripture first. In John sixteen thirteen, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, as the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. We live in a world right now that makes truth seem relative, makes truth seem like truth may be this, truth may be that. But in reality, we have a standard, and I can tell you right now that standard is the Bible. We have God's word, and that is what truth is. We have lies from the enemy regarding uh, different truths, regarding gender, sexuality, and marriage. When in reality, we we know what the Bible says. Those were just a few examples. But this is why we need the Holy Spirit as a guide. We need the Holy Spirit as a convictor. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth. Because when we look around our world, when we watch the news, when we're in our workspaces, for me, when I go to my school, I go to Lamar University, we can see some of these things in the church as well. In some churches, it is a strong tell of the lack of the Holy Spirit. If fruit is not being produced, then it allows me to begin to question Because there is no doubt that the times we live in are difficult times and that the truth is difficult to navigate in general in times like this, but that is why we have the Holy Spirit, friends. That is why we have the Holy Spirit as a guide. That is why we have the Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth. The Spirit of truth himself is guiding us into all truth. Because let me just say that the truth is the truth and it will always be the truth. And the truth is God's word. And so we thank God that he has sent his, uh, his spirit, his Holy Spirit, to guide us into those truth, into his truth. So we have our four points. We have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the sal- salvation role of the Holy Spirit, the guiding role of the Holy Spirit, and the teaching role of the Holy Spirit. Not necessarily in any order, but I want to take it back to my original question that I proposed to you all this morning. If the Holy Spirit were to leave you individually, 
or if the Holy Spirit were to leave this church, would anybody notice? And I think there are some few tells, I kind of talked about it earlier, of the Holy Spirit being evident in your life. And so this could also be asked with a, a different question of the question, saying, what does being filled with the Holy Spirit look like? And so my first example is we talked about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit earlier. We talked about how Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come upon you, which was different than the indwelling. He said the Holy Spirit will come on you. And then we see in Acts 2, Jesus did not lie. The Holy Spirit came upon them. That There was a rushing wind that came into the room. The Holy Spirit came on them and it said tongues of fire came upon them. Oh, and I have the verse right here. That's nice. <laughs> Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This doesn't end with the disciples. This doesn't end with the apostles and whoever else was surrounding the 3,000 that got saved that day because of Peter's message because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't end with us either. It doesn't end with the generations after us. In Matthew, he talks about the Great Commission. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. It begins with us in this generation. And then we see in Acts 2, what I was talking about, 1 through 4, it says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of, or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And I'm, I'm saying that would be cool if that happened today. I'm not saying that has to happen today. Because if we're looking for a direct uh, replication of history, I think we may be looking in the wrong place. But don't get me wrong, the Holy Spirit still works in miraculous ways. Because we see the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles, but we also see, as I mentioned before, the Holy Spirit comes upon the Apostle Paul. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it comes upon the Apostle Paul to preach to the masses, to the 3,000 that were saved that day in that, that congregation. And it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brother, Brothers, what should we do? The words pierced their hearts. That's Holy Spirit stuff. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit to then speak the words that the Holy Spirit has given him, and then it said it pierced their hearts. So we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as a tell, but then we also have the fruit of the Spirit, which I would go as far as to say is that the fruit of the Spirit can be more evident of the Holy Spirit living in your life than the gifting of the Spirit. Because we know the fruit of the Spirit. We have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And <clears throat> so Galatians mentions this fruit of the Spirit. Excuse me. <laughs> and then in Galatians 5, verse 25, it says, Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. Don't get me wrong. I... I pray upon this church and I pray upon this congregation that you would receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That you would receive the Holy Spirit so that we can see the things that we've seen in Acts. But what good is all of the gifting of the Holy Spirit, all of the, all of the, the fire of the Holy Spirit without love, joy, peace? What good is it, good is it without the fruit? This last scripture before we wrap things up, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2, it says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. This is the apostle Paul writing this. And so, I do not discredit whatsoever the giftings of the Holy Spirit, tongues, miracles, healings. I don't discredit that. I think it's a beautiful thing. But if I think we are aiming for the gifts rather than the fruit, and we don't have the fruit in our lives, what is this all for? If we don't have the gentleness, the kindness, the self-control to live about our lives and perform these gifts that have been graciously been given to us, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives, then what is it all for? 
Because when we live by the Spirit, this is evidence that there will be, or sorry, the good fruit in us living by the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is the fruit that we produce. And it is my hope and it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will enter every single person here, will empower every single person here, that we would see signs and wonders. But I pray also that we would have the patience to sit in this room like the disciples did for over 10 days waiting on the Holy Spirit to empower them, to come upon them. I pray that above all else we would welcome the Holy Spirit into our lives and bear his fruit. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you are miraculous. You are a wonder-working God, Father. Father, we thank you for our advocate, the Holy Spirit, that you have promised to us, that you have sent to us, because you are now seated at the right hand of the Father. Father, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit on this day, that you would empower us with the Holy Spirit, so that when we leave this room, we would be able to go out to our jobs during this week, to our families, when we have lunch with them later, to wherever, we el- to wherever else we may walk, that we may walk by the Spirit, we may walk in the giftings that God has given us, and in the empowerment God has graciously given to us, and but that we would bear fruit that is evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, I just pray that we would be disciple makers in Jesus' name. Amen.